Joining us on the How Did You podcast today is Mike Mays. Mike is a part-time lecturer in the Video Imaging and Sonic Arts at De Montfort University and is an outstanding human being who's always been there to help and promote student positivity and make sure they're all going forward. How are you doing today, Mike? I'm very well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm not doing too bad, thank you. Like Great. I said in the introduction, you basically campaign and help students get to where they want to be. But what was it like before you went to De Montfort University? Was the plan always to go to De Montfort University or was there something that you planned to do beforehand? Um, so, uh, work I mean, I... How far back do we do we want me to go? I, I, I suppose let's start from when I finished uh, sort of sixth form education because at that point um, I started my my sixth form. I was doing uh, physics, chemistry, maths, further maths, and psychology. So I was very much going down the sort of sciencey technical route. Um, always been very interested in physics. Uh, always got by in maths. It was never a huge interest, but. Um, to, to cut a long story short, um, after uh, what ended up being three years of, of A-levels, um, I was honestly just fed up of education. I was, I was done with it. I was tired. I wanted to do something else. And so um, I took some retail jobs, largely working in the outdoors industry, um, you know, selling walking boots and, uh, and tents and, and jackets and all of that stuff. Um, and that was largely born of a desire to adventure and to explore myself. Uh, so what I would do for a, a couple of years there, I would um, I would effectively work diligently for pretty much 11 months out of the year. And then I'd take an entire month off to go and adventure. Um, and I, I had a few really good adventures. Uh, I went to um, Morocco. I went climbing in the mountains in Morocco. Um, then uh, a little while later, some friend, a, f a friend of mine, uh, who's from Canada, who we'd, we'd visited a few times before, we'd sort of he'd come over and, and stayed with me a, a bit. Um, he and I walked across Spain together. Uh, that was a fascinating and grueling month, but it was really good fun. It was really life changing. Actually, I met people from all over the world uh, mm -hmm. on that trip, and then we went. I went over to Canada to visit him and and camped in the Great Bear Rainforest. So uh, that that was sort of my three big adventures. Um, but uh, as anyone who has worked retail can probably attest to, uh, it's not always the most rewarding atmosphere, and it, it very much relies on the team around you to to yeah. um, get you through your days. And I was just feeling a little lost. So I, I went back to my roots and thought about what I wanted to do with my life. And I've always had a passion for, for film and for TV and for documentary and that kind of thing. So I decided um, I wanted to go and study how to produce media. Um, I applied all over the country. I got accepted to a number of different places, but much to my surprise, uh, at the time, it was it was the program at De Montfort that appealed to me because um, it was a Bachelor of Science degree. And it was really sort of looking at getting you to a point of being able to be creative, but starting by building the technical fundamentals that you need in order to be able to express yourself creatively. So just, you know, going from having very rarely, scarcely used a camera before to... Um, being able to sort of do a degree and and things that are very sort of heavily lens based was um it was tough yeah but it was it was really good fun and i just sort of poured everything into it as i i have had a habit of doing regardless of what i've been doing i just tend to be a a little bit extra uh as a person um so yeah there was never there was never any plan to go to dmu especially it was just um uh, it was it was the program that appealed to me the most, uh, and I started studying there, and I, I never really looked back from that point. Whilst at DMU, you kind of really got involved with everything around you. Like you got involved with DMU Media, you got involved with Students Union. What is like if I had to make you choose a f best experience that you had with DMU Media or even Demon TV, Demon FM? in particular, what would it be? Would it be something that happened when, say, Greg James came to campus, or would it be something else that happened? Um, getting Greg James to campus and, and working with uh, the absolute superstars, uh, Ollie McGrath and uh, Hannah Rowe, um, who put huge amounts of work 
uh, into into getting the student radio conference was amazing. Um, but I feel like it would be uh, I'd be jumping on their coattails a little bit to claim that as as my favorite experience because honestly they they put in the lion's share of the work towards that. Um, for me, um, okay, yeah, there was there was one there was a month uh, in which. I worked with uh, a fellow student and, and good friend, uh, Youssef Mustafa, um, who has a real gift for securing interviews when he shouldn't have been able to. And utilizing the Leicester Comedy Festival as a platform, he, through reasons I'm not fully uh, aware of or, or, or really sure about, he somehow managed to secure our, uh, us uh positions you know waiting backstage while big name comedians were performing and then we somehow managed to just sort of grab them as they came off stage sit them down and and have a quick interview um and in the space of one month in in february we shot edited and got uh, 41 i think uh interviews out there into the world and you know, got to meet some big names during that time, got to to witness some genuinely funny um, interviews and experiences and stuff. And I was just very proud of um, what we managed to do together, because in terms of the production side of things, um, I think there was a bit of help on a couple of shoots. But it, for the most part, it was pretty much just Yusef and I gathering together bags full of equipment, loading ourselves up like pack mules. He would then sit in the chair and be his charismatic self while I would sit behind the camera and, and film these interviews. Um, and yeah, it was a pretty pretty rewarding and exciting experience. So for me personally, that was probably um, a favorite moment in Diva Media, but it, it is, it's hard to, to pick because I do look back on so much of it fondly. We did you know, large scale charity streams. We started doing live broadcasts. We got, um, we got more interviews with more big names, um, you know, some that, that perhaps weren't so well known at the time, but now have, have skyrocketed into prominence. Uh, again, Ollie McGrath uh, did an interview with Nigel Ung, who is now internet famous as being Mr. Roger, uh, yeah. Uncle Roger, sorry. Um, and yeah, it was just a it's just wild time to look back on. So as far as Demon Media um, is concerned, they they would be some big favourites. But then the the students' union stuff was that was a whole other chapter. To be honest, I was going to ask about that. To be fair, because that is the one time that you got elected for two terms, which is quite a feat. Because it's difficult to do. How did you find that? And what was it like being in the role that you were? And what would you say, sorry, was your biggest challenge you faced? Oh, blimey. So it's um, it's a bizarre job. It's a bizarre job being a student representative, a student executive, you tend to be called, or an elect executive officer, elected officer. The names are amorphous. Um, but every university has them. Every union has them. And we all generally most most unions are also then connected under the umbrella of the NUS the National Union of Students um getting elected itself was immensely challenging it was you know um the election period the voting period is a week and during that week you are absolutely grafting constantly um going around with with you know with your posters with your campaign material with your promises and what you want to do talking to people convincing them that you're the right person for the job um And it's, yeah, it's an exhausting, exhausting week. Then you've got this job with your big ideas and these changes you want to make to the world and very quickly realize within the first few weeks that you had no idea what you were signing up for because suddenly you're a trustee for a union, which is a registered charity. You sat on the trustee board. Um, you're feeding into these large scale committees and meetings across the uh, across the entire university and sometimes nationally at like the NUS events, um, uh, so on and so forth. And you very quickly have to go from being, um, you know, a plucky, usually a recent graduate. You don't necessarily have to be a third year, but most, I believe, are, are third years. You go from being this this uh, sort of excitable 
uh, being with all these changes you want to make and realize that you essentially have to very quickly become an expert in corporate governance, which that right there answers the second part of the question. That's the biggest challenge is, you know, suddenly having to get your head around um, legal concerns, around finances, big time, big, like sizable budget sheets, you know, at the, our SU is a, a million dollar or a million pound organization. Um, so annually you're playing with that level of money, which is huge. And uh, yeah, there's definitely a, f a few moments where you think, what have I got myself into? Um, but while it is immensely challenging, it's also a, a hugely rewarding job because uh, you are able to feed into these big structures. You are able to influence um, change positively, hopefully for as many people as possible. And um, you know, no, no two days are ever quite the same in that job role, which is why I, uh, I don't know, I've signed myself up for a second year and, and managed to get elected into that uh, again. In my second year, I also sat on the Board of Governors for the university, um, which is the sort of highest body uh, for the university. It's the main sort of uh, hierarchical decision-making, strategy-making um, uh, group, which was a whole other experience. You know, a lot of that was going down to London, sat next, sat in meetings next to people who have their names on buildings at the university, you know, who some of them are, are you know, multimillionaires or there's people with OBEs and, and you know, all sorts of uh, fascinating and, and fancy titles and such um, who've come from all of these wild positions um and then you know there was just me sat there as this <laughs> basically a recent graduate uh in a suit trying my best to to contribute and um offer my opinion to represent the interests of uh the students that I was elected to represent and make sure that that much as the institution needs to look at, needs to look after itself you know there is a necessity around that around how a university handles its finances where it can and cannot put its money um, but I was always keen to make sure that we don't forget, you know, our bread and butter, our students. Um, I hope I did it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you did, because looking back on it, there's a lot of positive changes, which I'm sure you were kind of the front runner for. But I also want to know, throughout your time at the Montfort University, you were part of a lot more. You went to DMU Global Trips, you went on uh, lots of different society fairs and stuff like that you were helping campaign at freshers fairs you were part of the fencing outside <laughs> of studying how did you find your experience um i'll be honest i may have overcorrected at times and spent a little too much time focusing on um on the social and the the extracurricular aspects and and at times perhaps not a, as as much time as I should have on my actual degree. Um, part of that, because a lot of it was demon media and such, it was, you know, that's the student society that's based around making, um, I did more video and radio content, but there was also the, the magazine that we wrote articles for. The, it was the newspaper when I first got there that turned into the magazine. I wrote articles from that for that from time to time. Um, by the time I was actually getting around to doing things in my degree, at times I'd already sort of dabbled in it with with Demon Media, so I was able to hit the ground running with it. Um, but I definitely, I definitely still overcorrected uh, at times, and and you know, a couple of my bits of coursework were not really very good, and I look back on them and think, oh, I could have done better, should have, if I'd have just put more time uh, and focus into it, but. Um, at the time, I thought I was doing the right thing, um, but I had a I had a whale of a time, like you say. I mean, that I I was I went on an international trip um, before DMU Global was a thing. That's our sort of um, student travel initiative. Um, yeah, I I had an absolute whale of a time, and and I was lucky enough to continue some of that once I was in the position at the students' union as a student executive as well. So. Um, chaperoned uh, experiences and and trips that we put on when we sent a thousand students to New York. Um, we got about probably in the region of three to four hundred, we think, students on the Staten Island ferry for a single trip, and there was sort of five of us corralling that experience. <laughs> um, I, I 
did similar in Hong Kong, which was, you know, uh, forgive me if I'm jumping ahead to another question, but as far as highlights of, of my period in the SU is concerned, the trip to Hong Kong was uh, absolutely exceptional. I had, a, I had an amazing time. It's a phenomenal city. Uh, I would suggest anyone put it on their to-do list or travel list. I'm very glad that Hong Kong was somewhere to visit because it'd be nice to travel the world, really, wouldn't it? And hopefully DMU turn you into a full-time member and you can help with the rest of the students going. But I want to know, obviously, before all this happened, before you were asked by Simon, which I'm sure we'll touch on in the podcast, you were a DMU student yourself. What kind of modules did you choose uh, for media production? And if you had to choose a assignment that went well, which one would it be? Um, what modules did I choose? I was definitely more, I was more drawn to the video and image side of things. Um, so in second year, um, could only choose the two modules. I took, I did take radio because I was enjoying the Demon FM stuff that we were doing. And um, I, I managed to get some really good um interviews and such for for our radio show that went really well um i interviewed uh, by happenstance i interviewed the uh president of the association of ukrainian people in great britain back in 2014 when wow. um when russia invaded crimea um and managed to get an interesting perspective from him at the time which has obviously only become more relevant in recent days um i also got to interview an astronaut for the radio that was pretty fun um he, he turned up to leicester space museum and um again i've i so, so many of these things i look back on and think how actually did i get there? <laughs> like what 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 landed me in that room because i'm just uh i'm just an enthusiastic guy with a camera most of the time and <laughs> apparently sometimes that's enough um you bring that sincere enthusiasm along and, and people tend to be willing to uh to let you point that enthusiasm at something um but anyway i've digressed from your question and uh, i yeah I, I took video in the final year i took post-production for video and film um advanced imaging techniques which was a photography module at the time um oh, i can't remember <laughs> I don't remember all of them um but yeah i was certainly more drawn into the into the um video and image side of things um as for an assignment that went particularly well i have to have to point at my uh final year tech project um which was all around um it was all around looking at uh the production of um video for non-profits um, so I was working a lot with a charity, a local charity, um, a couple of local charities, actually, largely through DMU's uh, charity initiative, Square Mile. Um, and with that, I got to do some filming for the Rick Basra leukemia campaign, which is about re getting people registered to the Anthony Nolan stem cell register. Um, and particularly looking to diversify that register because there's, you know, in Leicester, we have a sizable South Asian um uh population and community um but there's an underrepresentation of that community if if one of them needs stem cells and rick basra is uh, an individual um who found himself in need of that he got leukemia um and he needed stem cells and very very you know when things were looking um tough uh luckily he found uh, a match through the the register and uh, managed to dedicate, well, he, he managed to recover and went on to, to create the Rick Basra Leukemia Campaign and start a major charity drive, which has registered, oh, I, I've, I've lost count. It must be tens of thousands of people to this register, which only increases the likelihood of people being able to find that donor that they need. Um, he's an incredible person to work with him and, and his wife, Kaz. They're both absolutely wonderful. And many of the other volunteers I worked with at the time. Um, of course, not wanting to forget to credit all of them. Um, but he's now, uh, if I'm getting the term correct, correct, he's now a deputy um, Lord Lieutenant of Leicestershire. Uh, it was a recent development that, that he's been um, put into um, in recognition of his incredible 
uh, work for charity and for the local community. And I was, I was a, uh, you know, I was there for a little bit of that, and I was there for for an amazing campaign. Uh, called Pass It On, where each day for 30 days we went to a different location. I was filming, I was volunteering, I was helping them out. And and on the final day of that 30 days, we showed the video that showed that journey of that month um, in a, a room full of local dignitaries at uh, Leicester City Hall, which was amazing. You know, all, all the local MPs were there, um, you know, big uh, business leaders and, and you know, I think people like um, higher ups in the local NHS, fire service, police, etc. Um, and yeah, that was that was awesome. I got to be there for that. Um, sorry, I, I meandered into a, a whole story there. Uh, but yeah, that was that was one of three videos I did for my final year tech project. So that's how it started. And, and then I was also able to produce um, a fantastic video working with an amazing local artist, uh, a chap called Marcus Dove, who um, is an exceptional artist. He's still doing amazing things uh, to this date. And then I, I did a final video where I actually got to go over to India um, and I was filming um, with a couple of students in India and I was filming at a, a community school, um, you know, effectively for, for um, uh, for very impoverished um, children in India, um, I filmed at the uh, at the ashram in Ahmedabad, where Mahatma Gandhi lived for many years of his life, and uh, and this was all wrapped into my my final year tech project, which you know that's that's a ridiculous thing to spend a year doing, um, but I was immensely proud of, and I still am immensely proud of the the work that I I did and the fact that I was. You know, um, I was supporting charities and supporting these these incredible initiatives while I was also getting part of my degree done. Um, it was exhausting at times. It was a very grueling uh, project, but um, yeah, wouldn't wouldn't change that for the world. So absolutely, that'll be my assignment that went especially well. It's very empowering to hear because I can only imagine what it would be like to share that video in, like you say, the City Hall and have that kind of reception that you would have got. But you've had a lot of impact on a lot of different people and I'm sure it's recognised. But if I remember correctly, I think it may have been second year because obviously the pandemic hit and took the campus basically out. Um, you said something along the lines of the street that you lived on was one of the highest achieving or something along those lines. Yeah. yeah um... It was it was it was in my second year, so sadly I can't take credit, but the, the street that I lived on just so happened to be the street in the UK that got the most first class degrees out of it. <laughs> um yeah, it was a, purely by chance. Uh but yeah. Do you feel as if this was something that helped you being noticed by, say, Simon and everybody at DMU to offer you like opportunity at teaching? Like how did this all happen? So it was after I'd finished my time in the students union because honestly it would be it would be inappropriate to um to work at both a university and a union at the same time they are decidedly supposed to be separate uh entities um so i wouldn't want to be a sort of member of staff at the at the university while also trying to sort of be a a critical friend to the university uh, as a student exec but um yeah it was about oh six seven months after that um I just got a I got a, a call from um, Simon Walsh, the uh, program leader for media production, um, as he was at the time, um, basically saying, "Would I be willing to come and do some some teaching?" Uh, and at first, I was sort of covering um, a first year module, uh, which is largely just doing the the fundamentals, the basics of uh, image and video capture. And I thought, you know, yeah, sure. Um, I can do this for a bit. That'll be that'll be fine. Um, and to my surprise, I absolutely love doing it. Um, I, I really, really enjoy working with students. I love explaining things to students and, and trying to make sure that I'm communicating things in a way that the person I'm talking to can understand. Because that we we all learn in different ways. There's no one size fits all approach. And that sort of problem solving aspect of teaching became really compelling to me. And the 
uh, the light bulb moment or the penny drop moment when you're explaining a concept to a student and you see it click. Honestly, that's that is a rush <laughs> to be on on the end of that and and to to get that across to people. Um, and I absolutely love I love helping creative people create cool things. I love working with ambitious people to realize those ambitions. And yeah, uh, teaching has become. Um, unexpectedly a place where I really feel I've I've found my vocation in life you know it's more than a job at this point it's something I, I genuinely just love doing and uh, the more of it I get to do the merrier I am um, yeah I feel I feel very lucky to work with so many cool people and um, you know each year it seems it's it's grown a little from the previous so at first I was sort of I was just covering that that first year module and then I got brought on and helped overhaul a, a module in the second year and then this and I was also uh, started taking on some students for their final year technology projects um, you know supporting them through that understanding the academic and research process um, and then yeah onwards onwards and upwards and and this this past year I've been covering largely on a third year module uh, a couple of third year modules um, a little bit of support for some second years, and uh, I've had 10 uh, final year tech project students, which is a lot. Um, but I've been there to sort of meet with them throughout the year and uh, and guide them through their own, their own self-defined and often very ambitious projects. Um, and I feel very lucky to do that. Um, I've also worked on a couple of other programs outside of media production. So I've worked with some visual effects students. Uh, I have in the past, I've worked with some audio tech students. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's a joy. It's an absolute joy. Uh, so yeah, I feel very fortunate to to have been given that, that first opportunity. It was never meant to be long-term or it was never expected when I first sort of went yeah I'll do this for a bit it was never expected that a few years down the line I'd still be doing it and just absolutely loving it um but here I am <laughs> and uh I wouldn't change it really wouldn't I'm gonna take it one step further and I'm gonna ask you to think ahead of time where do you want to be in the future what are your personal hopes or what are your hopes as a lecturer or anybody like that um so you mentioned earlier uh that I'm still I'm a part-time lecturer at the minute um as a part-time lecturer this last year I've been doing 18 hours of contact time plus tutoring time per week which is which is equivalent to and sometimes greater than the the contact time that a full-time lecturer has so it's been it's been a challenging um year it's been uh pretty uh pretty exhausting at times um that's that has fluctuated throughout the year as well so 18 was was the peak i think and it was quieter at other periods um but it's 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 been it's been hard work at times and uh what i would love to do is is be able to turn that into a legit full-time position so that i'm i'm uh constantly able to focus on lecturing and not spread myself quite so thinly while doing um, other work and other jobs and such um, and uh, yeah I would love to do uh, a master's degree that that feeds into a PhD um, I've got a real interest at the minute in uh, virtual reality and the sort of fledgling craft of virtual reality storytelling I think that while there are certainly a number of things that that we've discovered through telling stories uh, in films and in uh, video games by extension um, I think there are opportunities and undiscovered methods that will apply specifically to the way that we can tell stories inside of virtual reality headsets and inside of these three-dimensional worlds that people can place themselves within now. And I would love to do a PhD that looks into that in a little more detail and hopefully contribute something to the entire scope of human knowledge um, that will help people to make those stories um yeah i keep i keep using the term stories this has been a relatively recent uh, epiphany of mine i've realized that so much of 
of what I do and what I love is motivated by the simple fact that I just love a good story, whether it's whether it's TV, film, games, uh, books, comics, uh, what, you know, telling a story with with friends, playing Dungeons and Dragons. It's so much of of what motivates me is just great stories, because I think it was uh, Terry Pratchett that says that uh, humans need fantasy to be in the place where the falling angel meets the rising ape and that uh there's a there's a profoundness there that that i really do buy into i think that stories are so immensely powerful for us and um and they they in their own sense can be a source of of positive change of motivation can be a a springboard into more creativity into more art into more empathy around the world, into more connections between different people. And uh, yeah, I, I, that's where I draw a lot of my inspiration from. So I would love to, to move into this teaching full time. So I'm still, I've still got that, you know, that drug-like teaching experience that's just, that absolutely uh, keeps me motivated, keeps me excited to wake up every day and turn up to work. I want to, to look into helping all of us tell different stories, better stories, uh, stories in spaces where we didn't know we could tell them before or tell them in ways that we, we hadn't considered until new technologies emerge. And, uh, and then, yeah, continue to equip other people and other students and other academics and other, other storytellers to do those very things. So perfect world, five years time. I'm still teaching, but I'm well into uh, a PhD Hopefully I've been able to see a bit more of the world as well, because I will never lose that that lust for travel and uh, that thirst for knowledge and experience and, and understanding and ex uh, meeting more people and connecting with more cultures. And um, so, yeah, hopefully still doing that all at the same time. Um, but, yeah, I don't I don't want to lose lose touch with this teaching stuff. I'm going to throw it out to you as a person. If I had to ask you as Mike and not a lecturer Mike, what is your favorite piece of technology? Or if I had to ask you, what are you currently watching? What are you currently listening to? What is the current situation? Uh, so, I mean, technology is a, that's a challenging one. On a very base level, I don't think you can go far wrong with just saying the internet. You know, it's, it's probably the single greatest thing that humanity has collaborat collaboratively achieved making all of knowledge and and all of experience accessible at a, at our fingertips um wow what a huge impact that's had on society positive and negative certainly and i think we're still navigating and negotiating with exactly what our relationship is with the fact that we have you know all of humanity generally or the vast majority of um so close to us um so yeah easy one favorite technology uh, as for what I'm watching right now, um, uh, I last summer I'm not quite sure what it was, but something uh, a flip switched in in my brain, and I decided to start uh, exploring and learning about and indulging in um, a storytelling medium that is tremendously popular today, even more so than ever before, but one with which I had scarcely engaged, uh, which is the the wonderful world of anime. Um, I, I'd, I'd never been an avid anime watcher. Certainly, I watched Pokemon as a kid. Uh, that was that was something I loved. I loved saving up two pound fifty so I can go to the local corner shop and buy a pack of booster cards. Um, and uh, I, I then, when I was a little bit older, I, I would check out, you know, the, some of the Sky channels that would have a bit of anime on. I watched uh, quite a lot of Dragon Ball Z. Uh, unintendedly wearing a Dragon Ball Z T-shirt today. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I I'd, I'd never really properly dived into this realm. And I know it's hugely popular and there are uh, huge fans of anime out there. And so I just, I wanted to get in on the action and learn a little bit more. So I started uh, asking friends who knew more about the subject than I did. Uh, and even asking students, you know, have you got any recommendations? What should I, what should I ask to my watch list, add to my watch list? Um, and yeah, I started down the, the, ever engulfing rabbit hole that is anime uh so 
Um, what I'm watching right now, I've got three series that I'm currently watching my way through. Uh, one is Dragon Ball Super, follow on from Dragon Ball Z that I watched as a kid. Uh, only it's it's more uh, ridiculous and insane than it ever was, which is saying something. Um, I'm watching Gurren Lagann, which is a quite a short mecha anime, um, which has been really, really enjoyable so far. I'm only sort of a third of the way through. And then I have been watching uh, one of the biggest anime uh, of all time, uh, One Piece, which has been taking up probably unhealthy amounts of my time uh, in recent days because there's a thousand episodes to jump through and um yeah i i started watching it on a whim uh i don't want to go down down the rabbit hole of anime too much but basically what it was was once i started learning about anime i learned of this concept of the big three um which are allegedly supposedly these three long ongoing anime that in the sort of i think it's in the early noughties were immensely popular and sort of helped to really rocket um japanese animation to the level of prominence that it has today um and those three series are bleach uh naruto or naruto and uh one piece and I just thought, hey, I want to watch one of those. Which one's got the most episodes? One Piece. I'll start there. What's it about? It's about a rubbery kid who wants to become king of the pirates. Okay, that'll be a fun time. And now I'm 630 episodes <laughs> down the line, and it's it's one of the best things I've ever seen. It's amazing. I've never actually watched any anime. Fair. It's a, it's a whole other world, man. You know, they there's they are willing to take stories in a direction that I think Western media tends to shy away from, you know, not to say that there's not good Western media at all. I mean, that that's what I listened to for most or I'm watched and indulged in for most of my life. Um, but anime has just got, it's got a real imagination to it. Um, in the same way that in, when you watch something like game of Thrones, you're not sure that any character is ever all the way safe. You've very much got that going on in a lot of anime series, you know, um, big, well-established characters can just reach the end of their story as the story continues going, and you know that's that's uh, well, sadly that's life uh, sometimes. And so, yeah, there is there is a um, there's something oddly compelling about it that I can't quite put my finger on yet because I'm still a fledgling. You know, I'm I'm coming up to one year of experience, and there are uh, many other anime fans who've been doing this for for decades. So I'm very much a, a novice. Um, in this realm, but uh, enjoying every minute, and uh, like I'm just, I'm very much having a good time. Yeah, connecting with these these very different stories to the ones that I would have typically been into or familiar with. I can completely understand that because it's like people are currently addicted with Stranger Things. People are addicted with loads of different shows, and it's, I guess it depends on what you want to watch, and. I know quite a few people that have watched anime, but it's just never something I've dove into. Um, if I had to ask you your inspirations or people you'd look up to, is there a certain group of people, a certain person, or is it just you go by life as it is? <laughs> I'm inspired by everyone and everything. Um I think one of the reasons I I touched on this earlier, but I think one of the reasons that I have sort of from my experience sort of stumbled into these, these incredible experiences and opportunities in life is because I am someone who is, I I want to constantly be learning. I'm, I'm always looking for opportunities to learn more just in day-to-day life. Um, I have a sort of core fundamental belief that, Every single person that we meet is more intelligent than us in some way. And it's kind of our job to find out that angle, find out that way and connect with with people in the way that they can they can contribute something to you more more than more than uh, more than you more than you already know, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm I'm legitimately fascinated by almost everything and almost everyone and uh and I, I think that enthusiasm 
is a, a huge source of inspiration for me. Um, however, I will concede that as you were asking that question, the first name that jumped into the forefront of my head is Sir David Attenborough, who, you know, I much as absolutely it, it, long before I ever started watching Pokemon. I had VHS box sets of David Attenborough documentaries and I'd come back from school as l legitimately starting from, you know, toddler age. Like, <laughs> and, and then later, even, even like starting primary school, I would come back from, from primary school and I would put in um, the David Attenborough VHS of the day and I'd watch them over and over and over and over again. And I think very probably as well as my upbringing and you know my my mum who's always been amazing and a lot of the experience i've had but i really do think that 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 um visibility of the wider world of the natural world uh, that i got from being so uh, enamored with sir david attenborough's um productions from an early age has been massively formative for me and i think uh, i think a lot of that has has probably contributed to that constant um, inquisitive, eager to learn, genuinely fascinated nature that I try to to push to the forefront of myself um, every waking day as much as I can. With that all in mind, it's clear that you've had a great experience, whether it be through academia, just through life, or just growing up around anime, technology, or anything, just, I guess, living life to the fullest. <laughs> what If you had to give one bit of advice to somebody whether it be a media graduate or just somebody that you ever met or somebody who is currently studying media anybody what bit of advice would you give them why be enthusiastic definitely it's it's got to be in there but to try and offer something new to this conversation um honestly just empathize with people I say that like it's easy. It's not. Sometimes other people can be immensely irritating. Sometimes other people can feel tremendously inconsiderate. And uh, and we certainly, you know, a lot of days we go out, out of our front doors, um, we run into stories and situations where people aren't being empathetic and, and thinking about people around them who are, are just living very selfish lives. Um, but it's important, I think, to remember that even those people that comes from somewhere and it might just be that they've they've had a bad day a bad few months a bad bad experience which has has set them off that day that's not on you and it's not your job to fix certainly um but i think it it will only ever steer you well to remind yourself of that and to try and try and connect with people try and just put yourself in their shoes don't assume the worst of anyone no matter what they might be doing and uh, I think uh, that helps you to live life in a way that reduces the sum total of suffering around you and that's all you can ask for sometimes